Hello, and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Broker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And it's just us. We are recording a couple of days before Christmas. I'm off in the woods, and Jeff is calling in from a family, his family's house with five kids running around, I think it was. <laughs> yep, five kids and two yappy dogs. So we're going to do our best. Uh, there might be a few sound issues more than usual anyway, but uh, we'll be answering listener questions, uh, everything from marketing plans for 2019, trying to explain SEO and metadata, metadata, I don't know how you want to say it, depends which coast you're on, I think, and uh, which advertising platforms are the best for authors now, in our opinions. Uh, before we jump into that, do you guys have any news you'd like to share? I really don't have much here. I've been so busy the last couple of months just getting my household packed up and whatnot. Um, I do have pretty much my uh, sixth mystery just about wrapped up, which I hope to wrap up tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I know it's wimpy for news, but that's about all I've got going on at the moment. Uh, as for me, um, while this Patreon is still going, in just a few days, I'm going to be releasing my uh, uh, post-apocalyptic short story, which is it might be the first piece of original like non-series stuff that i've done on the pot, uh, uh, patreon uh big sigma five which is called indra station it's the fifth book in my sci-fi series is still up for pre-order that'll be releasing right about this time next month uh the audiobook for Ickerwell just finished that's the third book in the uh free wrench series um and also I've started looking into branding. I, I've, during NaNoWriMo, I wrote an urban fantasy thing, and I'm planning on making it a series and hopefully rapid releasing it. So I'm in the very preliminary phases of figuring out what the branding is going to be in terms of, like, am I going to give it – I'm probably going to give it an entirely different type of cover than I've done in the past and all that fun stuff. Uh, it is just – uh well no because uh, <laughs> that sells that will, you know <laughs> that will it'll sell but it'll confuse people because it's not quite that kind of story um that's being edited right now it actually should be getting back in just a few days and hopefully the editor will be like oh this is a pretty good story as opposed to joe i don't know why you've decided to write this genre um and other than that i'm also making some notes on ramping up advertising uh after the holiday season i i i let my advertise i never really did high large-scale advertising i was still like getting the feel for it. Uh, and then once Christmas came along and the advertising rate started going up, I decided to ignore it for a month and I will pick it up again in January. So right now I'm in between advertising uh, things. But that's my news. All right. I, I think I'm kind of in the same house as Jeff and, and don't have a whole lot of news. I did just a couple hours ago finish up uh, the novel I've been working on, the third book in my abandoned three years ago Chains of Honor series. And it's been a bit of a slog to get through it this month. Uh, I've also been moving and selling houses. And despite an earlier move in the year, I won't get in all that at this point. I'm afraid to say I'm someplace new because I might be someplace else in six months. But no, I'm, I'm hoping this is the, the one. And anyway, so it's been a lot of distractions and I've been only doing, you know, I've been like happy to get 5,000 words a day. There's definitely been some 3,000 word days. So um, for someone who usually writes quite a bit more, it's been a little frustrating and, uh, but I'm going to blame it on the very short days of uh, winter. So um, just so y'all know, even those who are, can be fast writers have their <laughs> their down times. I am hoping I've got friends visiting for a week and then hoping to like start something new and be really excited about it and kind of get back on the ball there. Um, but that's about it for me. I'm kind of uh, like Joe. I've just been not paying attention to advertising or, or really doing much of anything. I uh, I should go apply for a book club ad or something. <laughs> Sometimes it's nice to just let your brain forget about it for a few weeks though. All right, well, let's just jump right into our listener questions then. Uh, the first one's more of a, not so much a question as a request for us to discuss this. Um, they were wanting to see someone doing a crossover between urban fantasy and things like near future sci-fi of the non-post-apocalyptic variety. And uh, Lee says that his or her subgenre is so tiny that urban fantasy sometimes seems like the nearest neighbor so um, I don't know anybody off the top of my head writing something like that, but I'm... Neither do I. I, I. I have seen a lot of fantasy space opera crosses in the last year, year and a half, 
and it I would just say pick whatever it's closest to and, and make the cover and stuff that seem like it fits in the genre and kind of sell if it is urban fantasy you know that, that's kind of tough because it is a real competitive genre but you know hit on the stuff that's closest to what people like and then hopefully the elements you have that are sci-fi aren't gonna weird them out too much I feel like if you do fantasy and then have sci-fi elements, it's probably not as weird as if you do sci-fi and like, oh, surprise magic is happening. <laughs> so um, that's my thought. Are you guys, I know we've all done some kind of stuff that's <laughs> a little cross genre and not the easiest to promote. Yeah, I, you know what, it's funny, I was reading this, you know, the question of the non-post-apocalyptic variety. I was like, you know what, now that I think about it, I don't think I've ever seen a non-post-apocalyptic book. <laughs> all the, all the, all the post-apocalyptic ones, I, I read, or the near future ones I read, are all about some catastrophe happening. So, yeah, I would like to see it as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not, like, if, if, uh, if, if, you're, if you're curious if there are any reader crossover between those two genres, uh, there probably are again they're probably the closest cousins on either side of the sci-fi fantasy line uh i have written some stuff that had fantasy and sci-fi elements uh didn't really do well that was between between might be in terms of earnings per word my my lowest earnings because it was very long and it was cross genre like that so it's trickier uh if you're asking if you if you know if you think you can make the jump from one to the other i think that you can i think that uh the same muscles are being worked for near future sci-fi and urban fantasy but i'm not aware of anyone who's who's combining the genres and it'll probably make it harder rather than working toward the niche that that you feel is too small i also can't think of any sci-fi subcategories that you would put that into necessarily so if it is possible to fit in an urban fantasy that might be an easier way to go i actually was listening to a science podcast like space stuff and uh, they were talking about sci-fi fiction <laughs> sci-fi fiction we'll pretend that <laughs> made sense and how it is all really doom and gloom and they actually were saying yeah it'd be great to see some uh stories where in the future we don't screw it up and <laughs> we actually you know uh we, everybody agrees that utopian stories don't really work, but I think you could make a future where <laughs> we didn't screw it up, we got some stuff right, and there's still plenty of conflict because humans are humans. So now whether that'll sell, that's always a question. I'm uh, looking at that myself with the, the next sci-fi series I want to do. It'll be a farther future thing, but I would like to have hope for humanity to last that long and <laughs> to start colonizing the, the solar system and, and stuff beyond. Um, but yep, that that would just be it. I would probably put it in urban fantasy, make it close enough, sound close enough to fit, assuming it's not wildly, you know, different from what's out there, and then just kind of sprinkle in the sci-fi elements. I have written an epic fantasy story that totally veered sci-fi in the second half, and people like it. It was my second novel, so <laughs> it was fun. Um, so I think if they once they get into it, you know, you're they're gonna go, be willing to go with you. All right. Do you guys have any more thoughts on that? Uh, I don't. Nope. All right. Annie asks, or uh, I see a lot of authors giving their uh, urban fantasy a lighter, humorous turn. Is that turning into a trend? And I, I feel like that's almost required for urban fantasy. What do you guys think? Well, I, I don't read much urban fantasy. I can't really comment too much aside from saying I enjoy you know, a lighter, humorous theme going in the books because that's pretty much what the stuff that I write so yeah, if you're going to put that in there I mean I I'm personally all for it yeah I think when uh, when you're doing urban fantasy like this is a world that we know with things that we know are not in it in it so it's already sort of absurd and once something is absurd it's easier to lean into the humor of it than the try to make it less absurd like I'm sure tons of people do the grim dark stuff uh, but also just on a more cynical uh, like I enjoy the, the humor stuff uh, it's my favorite way to write but even if you ignore what you enjoy and just look at it strictly from a marketing point of view if you pull a humorous line out of context and throw it up on social media to try to get somebody's attention it's going to go a lot further than a an angsty line or a doom and gloom line like humor is just easier to sell even somebody who doesn't like the genre might like the humor so i i think it is a trend i think it's uh, as Lindsay said basically necessary and i think it's a good idea 
I should maybe correct myself in saying I think humor is very typical in urban fantasy, but it can be dark still. You get a lot of that kind of moody, sarcastic <laughs> narrator, I think. But uh, maybe those of you out there who are more well versed in the urban fantasy, I, you know, I've read some of the real popular stuff just to see what it's about, but it's not what I go to. I'm definitely a secondary world kind of a, a fan. But um, this is going to be, I think, episode 213. So if you want to stop by on. Uh, <laughs> marketing sff.com and let us know if you think that the lighter and humorous uh is becoming a trend in urban fantasy because if you can find a trend before it really gets started it, it, it never hurts to like be on the beginning of that all right so benjamin says if there's time i'd like to request a practical definition slash overview of metadata i hear the term a lot but i'm not sure what it means for me second same for seo it seems like something that's used to used to matter 10 years ago for blogging does it still matter thanks well metadata, right. i actually that's looked good. up definitions so i'll let you guys go forward. oh no you look at the definitions you read it first <laughs> okay well i can talk about seo afterwards because i actually used to pay attention to all that stuff. But um, for metadata is defined as the data providing information about one or more aspects of the data. So it's exactly as screwed up sounding as it sounds. Uh, but basically used to summarize basic information about data which can make tracking and working with specific data easier. It's always great when you use the word in the definition that you're defining. Right. <laughs> but um, some examples include, and this may be more helpful, means of creation of the data, purpose of the data, time and date of creation, creator or author of the data, location on a computer network where the data was created, file size, standards used, and I'm going to stop saying data because I can't decide if it's data or data. But um, basically for an author, what matters? This is the stuff that you're putting in on Amazon KDP when you upload your book that's not the description. Basically, everything, the description of the title are visible and then everything else is like helping to find, helping Amazon to know which category it goes in and if, when people search for it, which terms to be used. And it's very, yeah. yeah, it's the sort of stuff that Amazon and Google, we're getting to the point where it probably won't be needed like they should be able to figure it out. They should be able to just take all the book information and find out what's going on inside the book. Um, but uh, as far as uh, actually Rami was on last week talking about uh, how librarians, I think, use it to catalog books. And it's actually sounds like it's still very uh, important in the traditional publishing. And, you know, somewhere there's just we're putting in all the, you know, copyright date when it was published is all that stuff in order so the librarians can catalog it and bookstore and people too. But uh, as far as if you're an independent author, do you need to worry about it? Or even if you're traditional published, you probably don't need to worry about it. Um, it's just um, for cataloging books and helping people find them and computers know how to organize them. Does that, <laughs> does that sound right to you guys? It makes sense to me. Uh, that's all the information in there that, you know, it, it's not, they, they say it's not required. And you certainly don't have to put it in there, but I would recommend you fill in as many blanks as you can. Yeah, this is uh, like, yeah, metadata is basically like when it comes to eBooks, uh, metadata typically ends up only being um, the keywords. I mean, if you want to call a synopsis, a, a part of the metadata, it really sort of isn't. So it comes down to basically just the keywords and the genres. Uh, when you're doing paperbacks, you have a lot more stuff like that. And yeah, like, like Lindsay was saying, we found out that metadata matters a lot more for libraries. But uh, so like metadata is a thing that you probably don't have to worry about unless you're setting up a book in uh, uh, say Ingram, which has got a lot more check boxes and whatnot. Uh, everything else is gonna more or less be automatically uh, sort of scraped. Again, like Lindsay was saying, the, the, the people publishing your book are gonna generate most of the metadata. So yeah. And then if you're doing a website, back in the olden days when uh, people had to do all their own HTML, you would actually go in there and put in the metadata, the title and the keywords and stuff also. But these days the search engines are probably gonna ignore that because they can figure it out based on the content and based on the link text that other people use when linking to you, they can figure out what your site is about. Uh, you know, because early, early on people figured out, like, oh, I'll just put in a thousand keywords and that will help me rank high in the search engines. Um, as far as SEO goes, search engine optimization, this would be only of concern for your blog uh, if you're doing fiction. If you're doing nonfiction, yeah, I would make a title that um, 
if this is the same thing with keywords. You want to use words that are people are actually searching for, uh, whether it's on Amazon or on Google. And if you've probably seen it before, where in Google, if you're uh, researching, or looking up something kind of niche, a book result might come up on Amazon. And it's because they got <laughs> they put keywords in the title that match what you searched for. So um, basically, just putting things people are searching for, and there are all kinds of tools out there you can use to look up what people are searching for, both on Google and um, in Amazon. I feel like uh, we've had, I don't know, we, had, we haven't had the guys on that, there's like a samurai or something like that, that that's what it does. Or do you use that, Joe? Uh, I use, uh, what is it, uh, KDP Rocket. Uh, yeah, KDP Rocket is a thing that, that will, you enter in a couple of keywords you think are useful or a couple of books that you're, you're pulling keywords from and it will give you just a gigantic, as many as you want list of associated keywords ranked by uh, usefulness and stuff. Yeah, usually they'll let you know how often these things are being searched for each month. And usually you don't want to target the most popular thing. Sometimes if you target like the seventh most popular keyword related to your niche, uh, it might not be that competitive and then you can start coming up in some search results. Uh, again, more for nonfiction than fiction, but with fiction, like on my website, when I post a short story, I will post the name of the short story and then a free science fiction short story. So if somebody's out there on Google, like the name of my novella I did last was a uh, junkyard, which doesn't even sound sci-fi. So if the only thing in the blog post title was junkyard or junkyard novella, nobody's ever going to find that. But by adding in a free science fiction short story or novella, and then my website is already reasonably popular since it's been up for eight years and gotten quite a few links to it. Um, odds are good that somewhere in the search engine results, if you search for that particular thing, uh, it will come up. So that's all I would worry about as far as blogging is to try to use a keyword that somebody might be searching for and add that at the end of like whatever your post is. I actually get really frustrated when I'm tweeting things and people uh, use titles that don't tell you any dang thing about what the story is about. That's stuff you do not want to do because I have to rewrite the tweet so that my followers will know what the heck it's about before they know if they want to commit to clicking. And it's not going to help you at all in search engine rankings. You have to get a whole bunch of outside links that are saying what <laughs> it's about to overcome the fact that you didn't say anything about it. Um, and the search engines, of course, go by the description, the content on the page also, but the titles are really heavily weighted. So that's just something to think about, you know, using titles that actually somebody would be looking for. Do you guys have and anything to so add? Far as, <laughs> yeah, I'll go so far as to say is that, you know, there's a lot of people out there that claim, you know, for a price, they'll do it for you. And they're just like, oh, we guarantee you'll be in the top five results, top 10 results do your homework and it, yes it is possible to get you up that high but it costs a lot of money and there's a lot of people that'll try and take advantage of you so just don't give out your paypal account to the first person who asks for it when they offer to be able to do it for you yeah i'll actually get a lot of spam email about oh we could i found your web page and it's horrible and we could <laughs> do your search engine optimization to help you rank higher and my thought is always like well you found it so it can't be doing that badly <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah uh, they do that's mine too every like every other week or so but like oh to, to the web owner of this domain it looks like you've ranked really low on google you know we'll be more than happy to boost your rankings up there i'm like well you found me so clearly something's working all right so yeah, just be careful. Right. It's not a service I would ever pay for or recommend an author pay for. Um, what helps most is getting other people to link to your site, uh, preferably without you having to reciprocate. <laughs> you know, like just one way links come to your site tells Google that um, this is going to be an authority site now or, or someday. And then, like I said, the title stuff, you can get really in the weeds with it and do, use like, like try to use your keywords in the H1 tags and in the H2 tags and then use a bolded one and then an italicized one. I have no idea if that still helps. There used to be some stuff that said, well, maybe it helps, but I would just make sure your title is good and you should be set. All righty, moving on to the next question. Holly asks, what are your thoughts on the value of in-house promotions on the various retailers, Prime Reading on Amazon, the Kobo promo tab, Apple features, and whatever Barnes & Noble does? Well, the one I've had uh, a couple of times is, you know, featured on Apple. 
And man alive, every time that happens, it significantly boosts sales in that particular retailer. So if you can get them, by all means, use them. Yeah, I've had a lot of success with uh, with Apple promos as well. Um, uh, to the point where when I haven't had one in a while, it's very noticeable. Um, Kobo, I've I've because I'm one of the diehards for smash words, I frequently am approached for, hey, you want to go do this Kobo thing? And I used to think that they were pretty lukewarm for me, like they didn't really make much of a blip. But I think what actually was happening was I was doing them so frequently that uh, the blip was just sort of more or less steady. And then when I didn't do a couple, uh, I skipped a couple of months of doing them. I noticed that the numbers went down. So it's not a gigantic, you know, it's not like Apple where it'll make your quarter if you do one of these, but it's not without use either. As for the others, I, I've never been lucky enough for Amazon to come a knocking, and uh, I don't know that Barnes & Noble ever has, or at least they've never let me know. I've had a couple of mystery months on Barnes & Noble in the past, so I'm sure I got snagged by something, but it hasn't happened to, to a degree that I could uh, measure its success. But yeah, I mean, individual promos are typically worthwhile as long as there's not a lot of effort involved and you don't have to ridiculously discount. Like if it's if you've got it to drop to free, which I've never seen anybody try to do, usually they, they disqualify free books, then maybe question it. But if it's, you know, drop your book to 99 cents and be part of this promo, as long as the book is not already burning up the charts, it's usually a good idea. Yeah, I, I almost never say no to these opportunities. Um, I don't get too many Apple. I'm on their list for romance for some reason instead of like sci-fi fantasy. So I think there's only been one that I had a book that qualified for. So I'm trying to get up the, you know, nerviness to like email back and be like, dude, I don't really write romance. Can you put me on the sci-fi and fantasy promos list? Um, Kobo, the ones, the Kobo ones, they, you know, can help sell a few books if you're not selling anything there. I find that it's uh, it's kind of hard because you measure everything against BookBub. If I had a BookBub the last three months, I'm going to be selling really well at Kobo and Apple and Barnes and & Noble. And if I didn't, it goes down and the little promos don't help too much. But like I said, I haven't, it's been a long time since I've had an Apple one and that wasn't for my main genre. Um, prime reading on Amazon, make sure you read the fine print on that. They, I've had, I've seen some on other people be fantastically amazing. Uh, this is where basically your book is free for everyone on the Prime membership. And, you know, I'll be like looking at this book. Why is this book number one in the category for so long? And I'm like, oh, okay, it's free in Prime reading. And every free download is counting as a sale as far as figuring the sales ranking. Um, so that can be great. And then I've also, I've been in them and they're kind of like, ah, it was okay. I didn't really move the dial a whole lot. And, and usually with those, they're offering to pay you a certain amount, like 200 or $500 for the quarter instead of earning money from the book. So you have to decide, well, is this going to be worth it? Are they paying more than I was making from this book? A lot of times you're making more in sales than they're offering, but then you might get such a boost with the free downloads that it's worth it in the sell through for the series. Um, I, I have noticed with Prime Reading, I always, they ask me every time I uncheck the box to go out of Kindle Unlimited, KDP Select. It's actually been enough times like that. It feels a little Machiavellian. <laughs> like, we'll lure you back in because you have to be. It's almost always that's the commitment is to be in KDP Select. I think I have one time gotten an offer on my Dragon Blood stuff, which has never been in KDP Select, and so it wasn't required for one of their promos. And I don't remember what it was. And I sometimes they won't pick you too. So if you're weighing, like, should I stay in Select or should I go? realize that even though they make the offer you might not get picked so uh, I would usually still say yes especially if it's a series and you can get a boost uh, from people a lot of people checking out the new book one all righty next question Dale asks is there something new you'll be trying in terms of marketing your books in 2019 any new ways to reach readers you might be trying as for me, I swear this is going to be the year I get my first book bub. Even if I have to you know, submit every darn month or every week or whatever it is, I'm going to get one this year, so or the 2019. So, and that's how I plan on reaching a whole bunch of new readers. Uh, as for me, um, I'm I, the pay, I, I talk about the Patreon. The Patreon is technically still on a soft launch. Like I've not done anything that would I haven't attempted to draw anybody besides my core readers to it yet. But I'm probably going to be with this with this urban fantasy. I'm going to be trying for as a new thing for me. 
I'm going to be trying rapid release. We'll see if I stick to that, but if I do, it'll be toward the end of next year, like second half of next year. And I'll be probably trying to do the thing where you do an early release in Patreon for people who aren't on Amazon and then a stretch in Kindle Unlimited and then wide. So like the whole complex thing that Lindsay uh, does, I'm going to be giving that a try if I can get my ducks in a row in time for that. Uh, I also am going to be trying to get a little bit better at uh, advertising. Um, starting with the beginning of next year. And I also, and I don't know if this is going to come through because it seems like the project has stalled. I had some merch type goodies that I was going to be, uh, I was going to attempt to do a couple of promotions where I sold some autograph paperbacks, like tried to do a run of autograph paper, paperbacks and, and do tie in merch stuff. But I'll talk about that when and if the other cool merch thing that makes it unique actually comes through. All right, for myself, I don't have any big planned thing. I'm, I'm gonna be doing a new sci-fi series, as I mentioned, and that's probably the the main thing for 2019. I'll probably do at least six books, and if I'm enjoying myself, you never know, might do more. And then uh, maybe some side stuff and not worry too much about, I don't know, I gotta get some fantasy books out this year too, and, and sci-fi, and, and maybe I should go to the pen and do that. I think I'm looking forward to maybe I may be doing a few less novels in a year going forward. We'll see. Um, as far as marketing, I've been trying the last few months actually just to do, to be a little more engaging with the readers I already have. I've been trying to be a little more uh, doing more on my Facebook page, you know, asking questions, putting up just kind of some fun content in between the stuff that's, you know, like here's my book, here's the new anthology I'm in. So I, I feel like that's, with the way things are going these days, you know, it's getting more competitive. A lot of people are spending a lot of money finding they have advertising that I actually feel like this is a really good time to kind of focus on the readers you have managed to find. Um, because at the end of the day, word, word of mouth advertising is huge. It's hard because we can't quantify it really easily and say like, oh, well, that happened and five people bought my book. Um, but I've had so many people tell me they recommended their books and they turned their friends, their family into fans that I know it's really powerful. So I think just I'm trying to think about myself as a creator of value, not just as a, somebody that's trying to sell books is uh, going to be on my mind. And not to say that hasn't always been somewhat the case, but uh, I'm trying to maybe put a little more focus into that and uh, just keep those relationships alive in between releases and new projects and, and jumping over to other genres and whatnot. All right. You guys have any more thoughts on that? Nope. I don't. All right. Brendan asks, or he has a couple of questions. So let's start with the first. Are blog tours worth your time as an author? Have you guys done them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've done one. I've done one when I, pretty much when I first started out and I didn't really see any, any, uh, positive signs there. I, mean, I didn't notice any increase in readers, sales, or even people adding to them to, uh, you know, my, you know, my fan base or anything. So I haven't really seen much use for them as of that time, aside from just being a waste of time or not much return on your investment there. So for me, that'd be a no. Um, I also did uh, one or two very early on and I was inclined to say that, yeah, they're not terribly worth it, but I will say they're not going to sell a lot of books but they're pretty good for networking uh, to give you an idea of how valuable uh, blog tour and guest posts are for networking. The first professional association that Lindsay and I had were when I wrote a guest blog for her blog a while ago about book covers. And now I'm on a podcast with her. So uh, it can work out pretty well uh, to make connections within the industry, but you're probably not going to see a huge sales spike because of a blog tour. I also did a couple early on, and this has been like 2011, and I found that you had to do a whole lot of work because they'd want like in, you to do interviews, they want you to do stuff to talk about your characters, and then they'd throw it onto the blogs of various people in this network, and it was just hit or miss whether those readers had any traffic on their blogs. Uh, the, the thing I found useful about it is that I got some book reviews out of it early on. Uh, some of the bloggers would actually read the book and they'd post the review on their blog and then they'd often post it on Amazon and or Goodreads also. And at that point in my career, it was super useful because I had, you know, next to no reviews. So for that, it, it was worth it. Um, 
I think what I would probably do if this is something you're interested in is kind of scope out a couple of bigger blogs in your genre, uh, not necessarily by, well, either by readers or other authors, or, you know, if there's somebody that covers steampunk um, or does book reviews. I know the Fantasy Book Critic is a blog that's been around for ages. They, they did win a mine early on, uh, reviewed the book. And, you know, start posting comments, especially if you enjoy the content also. And then maybe you can ask to do a guest post um, for the people because a lot of bloggers, especially if they've been blogging a long time, they get you get a little burned out and get to the point where, you know, like, yeah, if your content is good, they'll be happy to post it. And, you know, and then it's very typical at the bottom to be able to include a little bio and like, here's the book that relates to what I was talking about. Obviously, you're not gonna be able to just talk about your book in the guest post. Nobody's really going to care. But maybe you're analyzing, like, I've seen like the 10 worst villains in sci-fi history, you know, stuff like that can be really fun. And also kind of link clickbaity for the title, uh, you know, invites people to tweet and share. So that's what I would do, just kind of, because then you know the time you spend doing this guest post is going to a blog that has a readership already, versus <laughs> there's, there's so many people with book review blogs that nobody is reading. It's just kind of their own diary out there on the internet. All right. Do you guys have any thoughts? Have you done guest posts at all? I've done I've done one and uh, and like I said it was it was kind of nice to do something there and I got you know some nice comments from some uh, other uh, breeders that weren't mine essentially there and I think I might have picked up one you know one or two fans there but this was right back when I was first starting so I was thrilled to get the exposure but I didn't really see too much benefit from it at that time that means right right now if someone had asked me sure I'd probably do it but uh, just because I have a different outlook on things and I've actually got a fan base now but back then it didn't do too much but then again if you're just starting out you know what it couldn't hurt right and i think it depends on the popularity of the blog you're going on to and like we said for seo earlier links back to your site are always a good thing you know assuming they're coming from a related content kind of site all right uh brendan had another question what would you do when first starting out to try to build buzz for a book if you didn't have any money for advertising uh, one of the well, one of the things I did was I really wanted to start getting some reviews going in, and obviously, you know, if you weren't making that many sales, because there's not many people that want to you know take a, a risk on like a brand new book with not any reviews are there, start contacting other authors in your same genre, and then offer to do a review exchange. Like, you know, I'll get your book and, re and review it if you do the same for mine, sort of thing. And believe it or not, you actually get a a lot of people that are willing to take you up on that. So that's what I would do for now, anyways. Yeah. Um... I'm still a fan of having something for free. Like if you can, if you can do an associated novella and give that away, um, or if you ended up with a series, I'm still a fan of the uh, the free series starter, or at least an exception, you know, a, a low cost series starter. So I would probably, if I if I was starting from scratch and, and didn't have any money for any advertising or promos, I would produce something that I could give away and uh, and push that a little bit. Right. I, I was gonna put that on my list too. If, uh, if it's at all possible while you're writing this first book, if you can do the, the prequel novella or a, a short story that ties in and really leads people to want to read more, set that up with your mailing list. You know, I, if you can spare, I think book funnel might be 10 or $20 for the, the lowest option. Uh, if not, nothing else, you can always just give it, post it on your own site and give people the link when they sign up for your list. And um, MailChimp, is free, I think, for the first 2,000 subscribers. So that's a way to start a mailing list without any uh, monetary investment. So I would, you know, have that free thing that is something really good that leads people to want to go, oh man, this is great. And I, I should definitely check out the first novel when it comes out and, and sign up for the person's list. Um, beyond that, I feel like social media is, it's free to do all this stuff. I would kind of pick, instead of trying to be everywhere on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, you know, either pick the thing that is uh, most appealing to you. Some people really love making videos, so YouTube may be a perfect match. Or something where you know a lot of readers in your target audience hang out, you know. Um, I don't think you can go wrong with Facebook. Create an author page. This doesn't cost any money. Start. Um, you know, just post something every day that's interesting, sharing links, asking questions, uh, you know, questions get a lot of engagement. I've found that uh, even when I did an anonymous uh, Facebook page that I made just to run ads on, that it wasn't too hard to get likes just from like, hey, here's a top 10 list of the coolest dragons in fantasy. <laughs> For some reason, I'm on top 10 list today. But, and then, 
you know, you do need to give it time. It takes time to like build up a following on Facebook. So that's why I would just say focus on one of the social media sites rather than getting crazy trying to invest a whole lot of time and everything. But usually when you don't have money, you have to be willing to invest some time. And then I would uh, focus on obviously posting stuff that your target audience is going to be drawn to. And you can certainly post some quotes from your books that you're working on and things like that, but intersperse it with things that are giving value or entertainment to that audience and that kind of tie in with you, you and your brand as an author. You know, I, I joked on here a few months ago how my most viral post ever on Facebook was a picture of a painted dragon toilet paper holder. People love that toilet paper holder. I got more comments and shares than anything I've ever posted. But I write about dragons, so it's loosely tied into my brand. And it's anybody that thinks a dragon toilet paper holder is cool is probably my target audience. So do some fun stuff like that and uh, mix that in with maybe more serious posts. And definitely ask for the engagement. You know, every now and then ask a question. And uh, that's because that's what Facebook likes. And that's how their algorithms will help you instead of you just posting out there into the void. And uh, don't forget every now and then mention your uh, mailing list with the free thing people can get once as you're gradually acquiring more Facebook followers. And, uh, and you can by start all means, by all means, from day one, when you start writing, start your newsletter list and start taking those subscribers. Yeah, and it's a good idea too, if you can afford it to have a website. Uh, blogging, if it's in your wheelhouse, if it's something you want to do, a lot of people find it's better to just put the effort into writing the next book. But at least have a, a, enough, a few pages up there, like about your books, about you, uh, contact, and like the free thing that you're going to direct them to. Here's the cool the story I wrote. So that uh, the last thing I wanted to mention on this, and it's not something I've really tried to do because I'm such an introvert. I hate to ask for favors. I, it would never occur to me to like try to do things for people with the thought that I'm going to ask a favor for them later because I just, I hate to ask for help. I won't ask for directions if I'm lost either. I'm like, no, I can figure this out. I got my phone. I'm good. <laughs> but um, we've had so many guests on this show that have had success by building relationships with other authors and we're simply asking if you know just last week Rami was on talking about uh, he pitched his book to other urban fantasy authors and got them to mention it in their mailing lists when he had a release and that is boy that's free for one thing if people will mention you in your mailing list and it's really powerful especially if you get them mentioning you on different days kind of in that launch first one week, two weeks you're trying to launch. I'm not against it. It's just not something I do because I'm not willing to promote people in my to my readers that I haven't read and enjoyed. And considering I've been working on Leviathan Wakes for two months, <laughs> I'm just not reading a whole lot of books right now. It is a very long book for the record. Um, but so that is my thoughts on that. Do you guys have anything else on there? I do not. All right. Getting close to the, well, a few more. <laughs> All right, Rebecca asks, who are your favorite authors and what is it that you love about how they write? What would you like to be able to emulate in your own writing? How do you each go about becoming a better novelist, wordsmith, and keeping each new book from becoming like all the others? Uh, as for me, I, I really enjoy Dan Brown, you know, with the Da Vinci Code novels. Um, I'm not really a big fan of the latest ones he's done in the series, but I, I did like, you know, Angels and Demons, Da Vinci Code. Uh, I enjoy uh, Piers Anthony with the Xanth series. Uh, he's where I really first got into the idea of trying to intersperse, you know, a lot of humor and, and whatnot in with my writing there. So, and uh, that's what I like to emulate in my writing there. And I really like Dan Brown's ability to completely and utterly describe a picture and I can easily picture it in my head and just like I'm just right along looking through the character's eyes and getting developed and pulled into the scene. That's what I always like to try and, and do. And as for uh, becoming a better writer or whatnot, I mean, me personally, I like to read a lot. So if I you know, come across the book, I was like, oh, I like the way he did this or did this happen to this. You know, I you know, kind of take notes for myself and see if I can try and emulate it, that sort of thing in my own books there. So that's me. Um, as for me, my two favorite authors, I, I used to be a vor an absolutely voracious reader and uh, I didn't look at the name of the author. I just found a book and read it. So some of the most influential books that I've ever read, I don't know who wrote them. I don't even remember the title. It was this thing I read when I was eight years old. Uh, since I became, I started reading and actually respecting authors, uh, Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett are two of my favorites. And uh, as a result, uh, Good Omens is one of my favorite books. 
Uh, I admire, both of them are fantastic world builders. And Terry Pratchett in particular has the ability to, t to make characters that are comedic and concepts that are comedic, but still have incredible drama and emotional depth. It's an amazing balance that he pulls off. So that's, that's what I love. And when it comes to, uh, those are the things I try to emulate. I try to have characters that are, that are uh, funny when they're supposed to be funny or, and, and capable when they're supposed to be capable and that sort of thing. And when it comes to becoming a better novelist uh, and trying to avoid having things be like the others, I write long series. And uh, the way I keep the series from feeling, feeling repetitive is the characters are always evolving, like relationships are forming and changing. So everything is always moving forward. You sort of can't repeat yourself because all of the characters are different than they were when they started, ideally. Um, and just getting better, I just sort of, I try to think more about everything. Early on, I just thought, here's a sequence of things that I would really like to see in a book. And now it's like, well, maybe uh, if I did this, this would feel be more weight later. So I just try to plan out a lot more in advance so that everything feels a lot more cohesive. And also uh, just make sure, that, along the same lines, take out the stuff that doesn't need to be there. So that's, that's my, my evolutionary tract. All right. Uh, my answer, I've mentioned before on the show that I'm a big fan of Lois McMaster Bujold, especially her Vorkosigan series, which is sci-fi. It was the first sci-fi I read, I think I found it in my early 20s, that I just adored the characters. I had watched so much Star Trek and Star Wars growing up. I think I Buck Rogers, you know, all this stuff that was on in the 80s. And I loved the characters in those shows. And so I was like, I love science fiction. And then I started trying to read it. And I, you know, I read about a hundred Star Trek novels, but you know, I tried to read the classics and I found that so much science fiction is written by like really smart science guys and they're really good at the tech side. And, um, but they're not always that great at making these characters that you just get sucked in and you love and you want to read about, uh, at least in my opinion, of course, I know some people out there listening and be like, no, no, this person is great and such. And it's possible I just had, hadn't tried it. Um, so she was kind of the first one I read where there's a lot of humor. The characters were just really enjoyable to me. You know, they're just right up my alley, a really quirky uh, lead hero in those books. Uh, no surprise, I love quirky characters. So if you've got somebody that's a little offbeat, you're barking up my tree. Uh, so, and as far as emulating her, I think it was more finding her and be like, okay, it is okay to write this kind of science fiction. That's, you know, it's really more about the people and uh, just, exploring their lives and the science is important to the story but it's it's not just like we don't need to know the tech of how the uterine replicators work we just know that now women do not have to have babies themselves they can grow them in a box so enjoyed that uh and as far as how do you keep go about becoming better and <laughs> not having each book like all the others i have to remind myself to try to uh, like if i'm at a conference and they've got some writing focused craft things I'm like I, I should go to that and, and I do and a lot of times it's telling me stuff I know but things that I know subconsciously and I may have forgotten about and I'm like oh yeah yeah that that is important so that's something I try to do and I'm trying to now and then if I hear a book about a book by somebody I'll try to pick it up I just read uh, Dave and Farlin has a book on resonance, which was interesting. And I think he talked about that maybe on an interview with uh, Joanna Penn a few years ago, or maybe that was his how to write a bestseller book. But it it's makes me think sometimes about, this one was kind of analyzing why some stories really were popular and, and why they had this uh, resonance and like sharing things that you've already seen before and how it's not a bad thing because it resonates with people. I mean, that's the whole theme of the story. Whereas I think as authors, we're all like, Oh no, we got to be original. Everything has to be original, but things that are familiar, but a little different. We've talked about that on here before are, are really powerful. So I have to remember that myself because I have mentioned I'm not very into pop culture and I'm, <laughs> I don't usually understand or know why something is popular. So I can't just go like, oh, I'm going to tap into that because, uh, you know, it's obviously important right now for the, the general population. But um, anyway, so yeah, just trying to read a couple of books now and then. I love podcasts, no surprise. So if somebody's talking about craft stuff, I will try to listen to those. Um, it is hard not to repeat yourself <laughs> when you know i can say that now i don't know how many novels i have i haven't checked now but i know i'm over 60 between my my name and my pen name and i've certainly had my beta readers be like hey 
uh, you already had a sentient alien plant trying to kill people in a river. You cannot do that again. And I'm like, oh man, I'll turn it into a, an animal trying to kill people in a river. And it, I have not the best memory. So it's sometimes I don't even realize I'm repeating myself. And uh, so what I try to do is just enjoy a lot of uh, nonfiction podcasts, uh, especially, and try to get ideas from quirky things that have happened in history or that are happening out there now. And that can help inspire some new stories. Uh, but then it's important to realize too that, and I didn't realize this myself, but uh, the things that you love, your personal tropes, you know, people may say you're repeating yourself, but you love them and they excite you as a reader. So there probably are themes that are going to keep coming up again and again in your writing. And I think that's okay. You know, try to make the plot as original as possible. But uh, some people will point it out and it can be kind of hard. You know, you're like, oh, why are you, go read something else if you didn't enjoy it, you know. Um, but I think it's, as a reader myself, I know when I've read authors and they do something really drastically different from the series I adored. And I'm just like, I am not into this at all because they moved away from the things that I liked about their writing and, and what they were doing. So it's maybe okay to <laughs> repeat themes throughout if they're really important to you. All right, moving on. This should be a short one. <laughs> Hi, uh, Stephen asks, have you guys tried to publish your books on Spotify or is it something you would consider in the future or you publish your audio books on Spotify? I have not personally. I haven't tried it either. I only have two books that I'd be able to do it uh, personally because most of my stuff is traditionally published. So they, they might be trying, but uh, I would try it with the stuff that I have, but I have not yet. Yeah, I didn't even know it was the thing. So I got this question and I went and looked it up and I was looking for like, well, is there a place I can submit my audiobook to Spotify? And I did not see such a place. So um, I'm guessing right now it's more traditionally published stuff that they're getting up there. Um, if I'm wrong, you guys, please look, come let me know in the show notes. Um, I might try it for one series. My inclination would be like, these guys really screw over musicians and pay them next to nothing for playing their song. So I'm not sure I really jump at the chance to do it unless I heard it was just bringing somebody, working for somebody else, another author, and bringing them a whole new listenership for their audiobooks, the ones that they get paid money for. <laughs> so don't know anything more about it, but if any of you do, please come let us know in the show notes. All right, Mark asks, I have two ISBN numbers for the same print book. Amazon paperback has one, the Amazon paperback one and the one I created through Ingram Spark. Uh, dumb mistake, yes, but is it something I should correct or just laugh off? And I already answered him on Twitter. You actually need a different ISBN for every different edition of the book. And if you publish it Ingram Spark, they're going to consider that a different edition than Amazon KDP. So uh, is that the same with you guys? I, I know I've bought, bought ISBNs just for Ingram Spark. Everybody else seems to be willing to give you a free one. Yeah, well, that's one thing I, I do realize. I mean, I have never personally bought an ISBN, but I do know like, like just about everybody will either give you a free one or else it needs to be something different from, a, from another one. So if you do have different ones there, they're going to treat it as different editions. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't worry about having done it. And as Lindsay said, I think it's more or less necessary if you're doing something like KDP print and Ingram Spark. Uh, so yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about it. You also need different ones too for different formats, like for audiobooks, ebook, <laughs> physical books. So, yeah, you know, it depends on what stage you're in in your career and how prolific you are. I bulk bought like a big order from uh, Bowker and it gets in the US, I know it's different. I think in Canada, they're all free, <laughs> but um, it's cheaper the more you get. So if you think you're gonna be publishing for a long time, it may be worth investing in a big chunk. Um, but also if you don't wanna do Ingram Spark right now, you know, and you just want to do Amazon KDP, like uh, Jeff said, they, they give you a free one. All right. Jared asks, what's the biggest thing you learned or realized in 2018 and how will that change your approach to publishing in 2019? Uh, me personally is that we've gotten quite a few guests this particular year that talking about how important, uh, obviously the, uh, the mailing lists are and what you can do with them. So I've taken some notes and I'm going to see how, how much I can in, in improve the, my subscriber list, increase it and what it can do for me. So, so that's my answer to that. Uh, as for me, what I've mostly learned this year is that, uh, my old method for doing releases and, and, uh, my old release schedule and my old launch methods aren't nearly as effective as they once were. The landscape has changed and the, you know, the rising tide has, has raised all the other boats. 
So I've, I've learned that I need to be a little bit more active in my promotion than I have been in the past. And I need to be a little bit faster with my, with my book releases. So that's what's going to change in the future. Hopefully, if I can remain as dedicated as I have been in the last couple of months, then I'm going to be able to put out books at almost twice as the rate as I used to. And I probably am going to try to focus on single series runs of books as opposed to alternating between series, which technically is basically an annual release in three different series. And it's very hard to maintain a career like that. So I'm probably going to do more focus on, on ser- you know, books that are in the same genre in the same series in a row over the course of a year. All right. And I, I kind of talked about this, how I'm going to do a sci-fi series next year. I think that's going to be my approach going forward is sort of like each year, a series, you know, and I don't know how long each one will necessarily be. And then give myself time, uh, you know, to catch up on older series that I need to wrap up or just to do some other side projects. I've been wanting to uh, do like some anthologies, uh, especially if I can hire someone to help with <laughs> reading the slush file and all that. Uh, and I, I talked about my novel Fractured Stars uh, a few months ago when we talked about standalone series where I did like a autistic Asperger's kind of heroine. And that was something or I knew it probably wouldn't be a huge seller, but I just wanted to write a story for people like me <laughs> that would resonate with them. Um, not in the way that I was talking about earlier but (laughs) just because it's like yo it's a character like me and uh you know if if you're in any group besides like the mainstream you know sometimes it can be kind of hard to find yourself represented in uh, fiction and you probably really enjoy it when you do find that so I think I just want to do a few more things going forward less not caring so much like does it make money was the launch good you know and just uh for for the love of it or for people that maybe I I want to represent or give them something that can be hard to find out there so um, I guess that's kind of my realization has just been uh, there was so much competition and stuff out there. I don't want to worry too much about like always like trying to equal my income from the year before or make more or you can be really, you don't want to, it's hard to lose ground, but at the same time you get to a point and I feel very fortunate to be at the point where it's not going to make a difference in my life if I make twice as much next year as I made this year. It was just, I'm doing okay. <laughs> so I don't need to really just always think about like, oh, I got to like put out so many books that I, I keep up with what I did last year. So that is a thing to remind myself of. And so that is going forward. I just hope to do a few more passion projects, I guess is the simple way to say it. All right, AJ asks, uh, how would you go about calculating ROI for advertising a series that doesn't have a set reading order? Whenever people talk about this calculation, it always hinges on figuring out your read through for the rest. Um, but if the series has multiple entry points and can, you can skip books, what then? Sorry, I kind of mangled your question, AJ. What do you do if you're doing something like romance where people can jump around and they're not necessarily chronological or it matters if uh, they've read the other ones? I can't be the one to necessarily answer this because you know, my series are actually clearly numbered and I have not had yet had any readers that have notified me that says, Hey, I you know, bounce around like crazy. This is hard to follow. So, but uh, yeah, I don't have any multiple entry points there. So I'd be kind of curious too. Um, my recommendation and I technically the book of Deacon has got a lot of entry points and is extremely nonlinear to the point where I lose people. Like I, I don't mean lose people as in they drop off. I mean, they don't know how to find their way to the new stuff. So uh, step one would be to have a suggested reading order. Uh, I, have a, I now have a, a place on my site I direct people to when they ask that has, uh, you know, here are, the, here are all the books that have been released and here is the release order slash here is the chronological order. Give people, stick to one if you're really trying to calculate ROI, but to come up with a, with a suggested reading order because people tend to read in the order that you suggest. Uh, if you can't do that, then maybe try to do it with little subsections of your series. So these three books are typically uh, read in a certain order. Maybe cater your advertising that you're doing to sort of mention that cluster of books. Oh, I talk about Terry, Terry Pratchett. Terry Pratchett's books are almost entirely standalone. Like they do lead on from one another and they have certain threads. So like there's the witches thread and there's the, the night watch thread. And you can sort of arrange your books into threads or themes and try to run those as, as reading orders. Uh, and update your back matter to support whatever reading order you choose. Because again, if somebody wants to read the next book and you highlight a specific book to follow onto in the back of your book, chances are they'll go in that direction. So just try to guide people toward a, an order is what I would suggest. 
All right, I have similar advices. I would make an order, even if they're all standalone and they don't necessarily have to be in order because people, readers need a lot of hand holding, which is, can be kind of surprising to us because as authors, we're probably really good at research and like finding things. We're like, why can't you just Google or look at my site? Here's the reading order. Or, you know, I have it every time I put up, you know, my links to here's the book in all the major stores. Somebody from like a minor, you know, Italy, Amazon is like, I, I can't find the book. It's not here. <laughs> I'm like, well, I put my name in and I put the book title in and it comes up. So I don't know how to help people, but you know, it's just to make things as easy as you can. And you'll probably retain more readers that way too, if you do make it clear. Um, whether at the back of the book or at the back of the book, you can put a link to your page and on your mailing list also like here's the list. Here's an order you may want to read them in and you can always on your website explain, oh, these aren't in chronological order. You don't have to read them in that order. Um, but that's not really the question you asked. So I'm going to try to answer the question <laughs> is how do you calculate the ROI for advertising when a series isn't like that? It's not just one, two, three, four, five, six. So what I would do is take a baseline, you know, what are your sales? Don't, not doing any advertising or just doing what you regularly do every month. See how many you sell of each book. Uh, I, I'm going to guess you may have, be have one that's, you know, it's a strong one and that's the one you often advertise to lead people in. And if you don't pick one <laughs> for the purpose of this and then, you know, run, run a sale, run some ads on it to try, try to get as many people into that book as you can can and then over the net you know and of course you're going to want to like mention in the back i've got other books this maybe this is the next one you want to try you know just then go check after 30 days after 60 days okay so how many more copies did i sell of the unrelated books in the series based on that and then then you kind of know that's sort of a not super scientific but you know if you sold 10 more copies of each book in the series or 10 of some and seven of some um, after advertising book one, that will give you a feel hopefully for how much you can spend on advertising that book. But I still recommend that you just go ahead and number them and uh, <laughs> make it a series because it, it makes it so much easier on the reader and you will probably get more sales. Okay, Quinn asks, what has been the most effective platform for advertising? Of uh, me, this, this is not Facebook. I've actually started tinkering with some Amazon ads maybe I left, I'll get back on the good list after all. And they've actually been doing pretty good for me. So my answer to that would be Amazon. Yeah, I have not done, uh, like I, that's basically my resolution for next year was to, to get more serious with uh, advertising, but I have had reasonable success with Amazon as well. Le uh, boosted posts and stuff on Facebook, but I've not scientifically rated how well I did there. AMS, I was able to get some pretty good, uh, uh, you know, average cost of uh, sale and all that. So I like uh, AMS. Uh, we've had guests on who have been super fans of pretty much all of the platforms, even uh, YouTube and Instagram, I think, which I didn't even know you could advertise a book on. Um, but I think that, and this is maybe not the most helpful answer, but it's going to be a little series and genre dependent because I've found when I do like the sci-fi romance with the pen name, I've had like the BookBub PPC ads or the CPM, whatever they have now. I've spent about a year since I've done BookBub. I'm going to check them out again for my next series. Um, those performed really well for the sci-fi romance. And I've speculated before that I think it's because that's not one of their categories. So they, the, the audience, even though they're there, they're not seeing the books they want that often. Um, but then I found that with my epic fantasy, it, it didn't perform nearly as well that I did a lot better on the Amazon ads with that. And I've had other series that did pretty well with the Facebook ads. I did a dragon, uh, my one fantasy romance with the pen name that I did with this really cool dragon on the cover, um, did super well on Facebook. So I hate to say it, but you may want to just put a little money and experiment with all, all of the major ones to see for your genre and your particular series, because um, I'm, I'm inclined to say BookBub and Facebook are where readers who buy books are hanging out. But we just had um, Michael Cooper on talking about how well he does with Facebook ads. And so, you know, sometimes with your particular series or genre, it's just one's going to be a little easier to, to really get the cost of the clicks down and to hopefully sell books. Cassia asks, what marketing, mo <laughs> what marketing avenues would you recommend for authors who aren't big fans of marketing? Uh, I, I actually found uh, the Amazon ads really easy to use. So if you're not that crazy about the whole process, but you still need to be able to do it, give it a try. 
Uh, yeah, I second that. Like, if you can put together an Amazon, uh, an AMS ad that is not, I mean, it's, it's fairly easy to not spend too much money on Amazon. So if you aren't a big fan, uh, you certainly don't want to be advertising on something that will burn your dollars as soon as you put them in. So I would recommend put together a drip feed of Amazon ads and then sort of let them run if you don't like advertising. So I'm going to, I guess I should have asked on Twitter when she tweeted this at me, because I feel like I'm not a fan of marketing could mean I'm very much an introvert and I'm not comfortable trying to push anything on people or make a hard sale. Or it could mean like, I really hate trying to figure out with the advertising, if I'm coming out on top, you know, like I'm not into the spreadsheets and the calculating the ROI and all that kind of thing. So depending on what, which thing it is you don't like, or if you just don't like any of it, I, you know, I feel like, you know, we've talked about this lots, but just if you have a, the free book one in your series, if you have a series, <laughs> you know, I don't know where you are in this. That's really easy for an introvert, non pushy person to, for me anyway, it was just always easier to be like, Hey, you know, my book one is free. You can check it out or not. No biggie. Uh, whereas I feel pushy even on Twitter, just saying like, Hey, check out my book. And oh, by the way, it's four ninety nine. Um, so you may find that it's just more comfortable for you to like kind of promote a, something free. And then that thing, that book is sort of doing the advertising for you. Hopefully it's, it's a really enjoyable story for your target audience. And it will then get them to go on and buy more without you ever having to push your books. And I, I think you get a little more comfortable eventually as time goes on too, with that, as you get to feel that people, oh, they do like your books and you're doing a favor for them when you have a new book out, even though it's $5, because they're really going to enjoy it. So I would say it gets a little easier over time, but um, having the free stuff is a non-invasive way to do some marketing. And you can still uh, submit it to a, several sponsorship sites and all you're doing is filling out a form there's nothing pushy. You don't have to interact with another human being like, okay, here's the free book see submission form for my book that I'm going to have free this month. Um, and that's still something I do. I will every now and then I like, Oh, sales are down or, Oh, I haven't marketed that uh, series in quite a while. Let me go do a free run or, or 99 cent run and just hit up the promo sites. So uh, as far as uh, if you don't like the paid ad stuff, because the, it kind of, if you don't do the math, it's really easy to lose money and not, and you kind of know like, well, I'm selling some books, but I don't think I'm really gaining any headway. And you do want to make sure you're not losing money. Like it's not worth it to lose money to get fans. Maybe, <laughs> you know, like if you have seven more books in the series and you see that you're losing money on book one in order to make money on the whole series and that's working, that's one thing. But you can do this. I would say you can start. We talked about before about doing social media and having a free book one and a mailing list and maybe doing some of the promo swaps with other authors. If your introverted side or, you know, non-marketing side will allow you to do that. Um, so there are a lot of ways, at least right now, I would just try to find something that appeals to you and that you, you've hear, heard from like our guests and other guests that has been effective for people. All right, Angela asks, how have your audiobook sales gone for your different book series? Do you see an increase in ebook slash paper sales when releasing an audiobook for an older series? Uh, as for me, I've got two different genres I've got audiobooks in. The, I've got one audiobook for fantasy and three for the mystery. And right now, even though I, I've been told, you guys, especially you know, from YouTube, for the, the longer the audiobook, the more, you know, the more people tend, tend to favor it. Well, my mysteries are considerably shorter than the fantasies. And right now the mysteries are blowing it out of the water. So I don't know if it's subject content or whatever the case may be, but right now mystery is kicking fantasies, butt. and I will say that any, every time a new audiobook pops up, I do see a bump in the sales, both in ebook and print. Uh, as for me, my biggest, uh, audio, uh, first off for me, audiobooks typically don't make much, uh, I've never had huge success with audiobooks. That said, uh, I have a lot more success with my epic fantasy, which is very long, uh, uh, than I do with the others. When I release an audiobook, again, as they're not huge sellers for me, I, don't, I probably don't have a very strong audiobook following, uh, but it is a thing that I can talk about and I am not as active on social media for actually selling books and on my newsletter and all the other things. 
I'm not as active as I could be in terms of pushing my own sales. So when a new audiobook comes out, I tend to have a bump in across the board because it's just another reason to hit my list. It, and, and so there's that. Even, even if the book itself is not bringing me a whole lot of other revenue, it's a very valid thing to, to potentially tell my fans about. So that's, that's where I'll get a bump. As far as me, the audiobook sales have gone very differently depending on like, uh, did we do a three book omnibus as the, the only option for them to <laughs> jump into the series? My Dragon Blood series has, uh, for the audiobook, you can only get all three books for one credit or 30 bucks or whatever. And that's been my far and away bestseller of audiobooks because it's a great deal and it wasn't all screwed up and diluted by having three different audiobooks first before we did the omnibus. It just happened to be that that was the first time Podium Publishing approached me was when that omnibus was selling really well in ebook form. And so we went from there. And I, I've since done stuff where like we did the first three books and then we later rolled it into an omnibus <laughs> and it, it diluted things, you know. So I, I would start out with that first. Um, with ones I've done on my own, I've definitely seen the most success when I've managed to launch at least the first ebook concurrently or really close to the time, that the, or at least with the first audiobook at almost the same time as I launched the series with the first ebook. The, as long as the uh, ebooks are selling well, the audiobooks do pretty well. I haven't really noticed that uh, releasing an audiobook in an older series does anything to boost sales and the other stuff, but I haven't honestly gone in and looked for that. It certainly wasn't anything that was super noticeable. I've actually, I would say for me, I'm not that excited about going back and doing the backlist unless I have a reason to really promote the eBooks. It's definitely been audiobook sales have been reliant on eBook promotions or just an eBook launch that's doing well. I would love to have that change <laughs> in the future and become an audiobook star, but um, hasn't happened yet. Andrew asks, do you recommend pre-orders for subsequent books in a rapid release strategy, or does Amazon suppress pre-order visibility? I haven't really done the rapid release myself, but if I was planning on doing a rapid release, I sure as heck would utilize the pre-order. Yeah, uh, I think that it's probably a very good idea to have uh, the next release in your rapid release already on pre-order when you release the first one so that as soon as somebody is done, even though it's only going to be whatever, three weeks before the next book, if they can pre-order immediately, then, you know, do that. Like, I think definitely, particularly because rapid release means short pre-order and the shorter the pre-order, the less you're cannibalizing your own rank when your launch happens. So, yeah, I would certainly say in favor of pre-order on rapid release. I've generally done it for a week or two ahead of the release. I, I've heard enough flub up stories on Amazon about how even very recently they sent out the wrong file when you did a pre-order. So I'm very nervous about putting anything up, but like maybe the type, the, the copy that hasn't been through the typo hunters yet. So I pretty much wait until I have it through the editor before putting it on there. And therefore I can only do it a week or two ahead of time. Um, but we, you know, we've talked about in the past how pre-orders maybe dilute the launch power because the sales are, are more staggered. I, w I worry about that less in subsequent books in the series. Um, and I would say too, I've kind of been hearing uh, that some authors are having more luck now with Amazon actually sending out to your followers an email alert, new release, new pre-order. And you might get multiple of those if you had a pre-order and then later a release. Uh, in the past, that wasn't the case, and I think they're still a little sporadic about those. It's hard to rely on those uh, <laughs> those Amazon, and it's just a free service, so how much can we complain? But um, I, I guess I've heard arguments for both ways, but if you're rapidly releasing and you can put the link to the next one in the back of the book, uh, it can't hurt. If you don't have it ready, uh, as we've had uh, get, you know, people mention before, you can always put a, a link that leads them to your website or something that you can later, you know, change that and redirect to the third book on Amazon or whatever. But you know, it's, it's up to you. You can play around. I, I certainly recommend a week or two ahead of time because just that way you have the link and everything. The categories are populated. Your also bots have started to populate. Otherwise you throw it out there and none of that stuff's in there. And you kind of wonder like, are my sales even helping? <laughs> you know, I'm not in any categories yet. Uh, so there you go. I don't think they suppress pre-order visibility for the second part of the question. Um, no, I think it, they just pretty much treat it like a, a regular book. 
All right, getting to the end, guys. Steel slats, I think that was John, <laughs> asked. He just says, with BookBub ads, he's tried my hardest, and I can never get them to do anything beyond giving me like 500 impressions, a click or two, and spending 60 cents for the click. What am I doing wrong? Well, I wish I could answer that one. I, that would be company number two that I'd be willing to advertise with that I'd like to start, you know, for 2019, but I haven't done it yet. So I'm not the one to ask on this one. Uh, I have done exactly two BookBub ads, and uh, I didn't even check to see how they did. Like it was, it was one of them was like, "Oh, BookBub does ads now. Let me try that." And uh, subsequently, it was just I think it was a backlist book I wanted to experiment with. So um, I would only suggest basically there's a handful of things that are generally a good idea on any site, uh, any advertising platform, and it comes down to you know make it look professional and give people a, a you know surprisingly the shorter the copy the better and there's not a lot of room for copy on on bookbub anyway so just uh look at what other people are doing and see which ones made you want to click i don't i don't know i'm not too helpful on this one uh the first thing i would do is start following bookbub has a a blog for authors it's called like insights I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes for episode 213 here and they often post helpful stuff on this just recently and i'll put a link to this too they did like 10 ads that performed really well for authors in 2018 and you can go look and see what's going on what's happening is your ad is not attractive enough and people are not clicking it so if you don't get people clicking it bookweb's just going to suppress the heck out of it you know and they're not even going to bother showing it and this is the same with amazon and facebook it's all there <laughs> the more popular your ad is the more clicks it is the more they're going to show it because they're making money so it, and then also your click what you're paying per click goes down just because they base it more how does it work <laughs> so they charge you based on a, a thousand impressions is it on bookbub i don't remember we've had a uh, better smarter people adam croft look for the show he had all about let me put that in my notes here so i remember to link to the adam croft episode where he came in last year and, and talked all about bookbub ads but basically you're just you're not hitting your target audience so whoever you're picking to advertise to you need to make sure your ad if it's epic fantasy and you got a dragon you got, you know, <laughs> there you go. Although, like I said, my, my Dragon Epic Fantasy stuff didn't do as well there. But you, you want to get a lot of clicks. And if it's, you know, I wouldn't add much text at all. Uh, free in Kindle Unlimited, if you're in Kindle Unlimited, can be really powerful. That wasn't necessarily on all of the ads, but you, you want them to click. And if they're not, just keep experimenting. Um, when I've done them, I've had my uh, cover designers, they do ads too. I've just said, like, give me like six different ones. You know, and some some have the cover, some just make without a book on it, with just the image. And then I've I've done things like some of the good ones I took like a five star review from Amazon and snipped like you know sexy geeks in space, whatever you know, like whatever I thought would appeal to that audience that was also part of re of review because then that's showing some social proof. So um, I would just go out there and try to find examples of people who are doing really well because you'll probably find your ads are just not <laughs> like theirs so or it's just not good for who you're targeting if you're like doing uh, steampunk and targeting mystery authors you know that's not gonna pan out very well all right last question guys don't know about it because this just came in and in the email it's from mark do you know if it's possible to change your author name but not create a new one not a pen name just a different original name like you started books by author William Doe and now want to change it all to all the books, covers, et cetera, to W Doe. Have you guys done that? I, uh, I'm going to say yes, you just need to change your author in the data when you upload your books on Amazon. Does that sound right? I haven't personally, I haven't done that, so I, I couldn't tell you. I believe you can do it. This is actually a thing that I've wanted to do for a long time, but I was afraid to uh, because uh, at the time that I realized that my covers all say Joseph R. Lalo, but on Amazon and only Amazon, my books are written by Joseph Lalo with no R as my, as my author name. I've wanted to go through and change them and I didn't because I was afraid it would mess with my rankings. But I'm reasonably certain you can do it with everything except potentially paperbacks. I think the because there's ISBNs associated with paperbacks and your author name may be associated with the ISBN uh, at the time that you 
give it to the book. So that might be an issue, but in terms of eBooks, it's probably possible. I don't know for certain. All right, so none of us have done it, so <laughs> we think it's possible. But if again, if anybody out there has done it and it went okay, feel free to drop by marketingsff.com, episode 213. Leave a comment, let us know, let us benefit from your wisdom. That is the final question. Here we are at an hour and 15 minutes. I always tell the guys, I think it's going to be a short show, guys. We just have like these 10 questions, and it never is. The guys are good. Yeah, yeah. every time you say it, that's when you jinx us. <laughs> You should just know like, oh man, it's going to be an hour and a half. She said that. All right. Well, this was our Christmas episode. So thank you everyone for listening. And if you celebrate Christmas, I hope you enjoy yourselves. If you don't celebrate it, I hope you enjoy your week also. Thank you guys for uh, hanging out here on Sunday night before Christmas. Yeah, you guys take it easy. And if you're out traveling like I am, be safe heading back home. Yep. Uh, so long, everybody. <laughs>